the dreamers. Conrad Goff relaxed on his seat on his flight from L.A. to Atlanta. He traveled a lot, but usually on cargo planes and the idea of leaving behind a paper trail made him uneasy. He had been careful so far, but it didn't matter, they were catching up. The Mimex software company sent him intelligence reports almost daily, his name didn't appear on any investigation yet, but the silent war he had been waging was being uncovered. There was no hiding 62 murders and upwards of 58 acts of sabotage and industrial espionage. The victims were high profile, the industrial and commercial targets were matters of national security. Conrad had endeavor for more than a decade in forming a wide network of collaborators, his own intelligence network, financed through Californian criminal enterprises. He could have retired years ago, but he wasn't motivated by money, but by total victory on his never-ending war against the CIA and the Pentagon. His schedule had to be carefully managed so that he could take a weekend off, Barbieri had seen to that, she oversaw the brothel and blackmail operation. They had been an item, back when he had a full set of hair and a few obligations less, back when it was still fun. She was Italian and Mexican, which gave her a strong character and a deep devotion to the cause. Conrad trusted her most of all. The boats should arrive tomorrow, but they won't unload the marble until Monday at the latest. Said Barbieri and Goff nodded quietly. The XHGTV anniversary party is on Monday, but even if you're not available the cast of Brutalismo won't be there, they have to shoot in Vegas until Wednesday. Goff asked for another drink and said send them something pretty, make sure to add a note from the LA team. After the first sip he added what are you really afraid of? I've gone dark before, between the apartment building, the TV station and the import company there's always a good excuse to ghost people. Barbieri sighed and looked around to make sure no one was eavesdropping I don't like the timing, the report, the invitation and the deep low business all happened at the same time. Can we really trust these people? Conrad thought on that and drank some whiskey The Rothschild brood is being quietly relocated in England, the heads up from the Navy's outpost in the Northern Sea might be the only source of information on the general response to their crisis. If the invitation were connected it would have come from different sources. Goff whispered the next part as for Diplo, he should go on with the meeting, tell them to escort the buyers to Brodsky, he should use uniformed police to break the meeting and shoot the hackers. Maybe they're real, or maybe they work for the NSA. We won't make money from it, but we should always be willing to lose a few battles to win the war. The report will change how we do things, the first part of the war is over, now they're actively looking for us. He remembered the cold months in Belarus, the dirty work that needed to be done. The renegade Gladio forces stationed there had planned a coup, creating a theater of operations against Russia. Stay behind troops were called, a mixture of local and American forces, some with brains and some with brawn. Misfits, psychos, and addicts. Assassinations under blankets of snow, shelled buildings, and oaths in the forest under the stars. Zanzibar had expanded, recruited, and allocated assets all over Eastern Europe and North Africa. The counter Gladio. It was in his blood, he was Hessian. His family had fought for the British on 1776 and now he worked for himself. There were rumors of mercenary networks transporting drugs from Afghanistan to Europe independent of the Americans. Zanzibar, however, wasn't in any report or intercepted communication, a phantom. It had been escalating and sad boy, the frowning hitman, and his friend was in the most wanted list now. He didn't blame sad boy for that, he was meticulous but the world is filled of coincidences and random chances. He would never talk, Conrad was sure of it. An FBI agent had decided to cuff and beat a suspect to death in front of his handcuffed partner. Sad Boy eliminated the target and the FBI agent, but not his partner. Random chance, now they had his face and his alias. They had met in Boston, after Sad Boy had saved Paul de Cefalu in a warehouse filled with Colombian drug dealers. They were friends and part of the American team, along with Anatoly Brodsky, Tig, and Barbieri. He hadn't seen his European colleagues since after the Belarus days. In a small villa in Venice, 
he had established a short contact with the others, they had reported good news. It was fast becoming a very different ballpark. Barbieri tried to relax, but it was impossible. She remembered the lazy days on her bed, drinking champagne naked and unashamed. She always felt liberated after a few glasses of champagne. The world seemed to open before them. They would swap family stories back and forth, they had known each other since high school. Barbie's family was mainly composed of Italian mobsters and lawyers. Her cousin Rena was a maid guy and one of Conrad's best friends. Now the world seemed more like a captor. It didn't open before them, rather it opened beneath them as a hungry mouth that could eat them alive without a warning. Each of them navigated a minefield and by now it seemed like a ballet dance. Goff reminded her of the bribes they needed to deliver, the Californian admission fee to the world of district attorneys, cops, feds, and judges. The fee to be decent rich people, a tradition since time immemorial. The plane landed with a series of shutters that reminded everyone that the whole thing was a plastic casing attached to wings. The squealing tires against the pavement. The motors whine. The impatient passengers getting up and collecting their bags. The tired stewardesses directing people like cattle. The well-rehearsed dance of unloading masses to collect new masses. It was all unavoidably other, alien even, the airport was not really a place but a building of in-between spaces built for waiting. They both hated it, and after collecting Conrad's luggage, stepped outside for a cigarette. Thanks for coming with me to Atlanta she just smiled and lighted her cigarette get me a souvenir, will you? She said. Goff smiled with his cigarette dangling from his lips I'll get you something nice. Looking at him, with his Balenciaga cargo shorts, his FC Bayern Munich soccer t-shirt, the Gucci sneakers, he looked like any other tourist visiting Venice in first class. Something about his serene disposition charmed her, just like every time she had to say goodbye to him. One day she would have to say goodbye from a phone in a prison. What other ending would there be for them? For all of them? Prison or dead? That was the fate of many of her friends and acquaintances. She looked at the other people, carrying luggage and hurrying for a car, they would never have to experience that, but then again, they weren't truly alive, not truly real, not like them. Conrad recognized the man next to him on the plane. Dr. Haluk Eskin, they had attended a conference on chess in the Middle Ages together. The flight was going to be long, but at least they would have conversation. The doctor had told him of the strange sight in Salahyar, in the outskirts of Istanbul in Turkey. A secret pilgrimage conducted once a year to touch the massive stone head of Alexander the Great. My sister finally married and I decided to book the same flight as you. I hope that's not an inconvenience. Conrad smiled and they shook hands. You did me a favor. Said Goff. They engaged on conversation, recommending each other books on the history of chess and bibliothecography the science of libraries. Dr. Eskin had a fascination with spycraft and, predictably, the idea of a secret pilgrimage fascinated him. He was keen of reminding Conrad that J. Edgar Hoover had organized the Library of Congress, the world's biggest library. Conrad owned XGHTV, a local station in the Los Angeles area and developed three documentaries about the intricate chess game that kings would play with each other in medieval Europe using a piece of paper and the postal service. The doctor wasn't impressed with Conrad, he didn't think he was all that interesting, however, he was relieved when Conrad said I don't watch my own channel, I don't watch that trash. He could yet be saved he thought. He could still be saved, he hoped, if he wasn't so overworked. Secretly he feared Conrad would take on the pilgrimage as an exotic vacation. The good doctor could imagine the rough and scarred horses frantically running from one place to the other scraping the incoming army. He could see the steel, bathed in blood, banging violently against steel and wood. The screams of downed soldiers, the pleas, the panic. The sight had seen hundreds of battles, thousands of corpses, of looters, of marauders, soldiers and thieves. Somehow the head had survived, somehow, despite not being moved into a museum, the head still remained. What would he conjure in his mind? 
he wondered. It wasn't the kind of question one asks, it was the kind of question one deduces for himself. Conrad excused his appearance I'm not taking the connecting flight to Ankara, I'll be sailing from Venice to Istanbul. I can't rent the boat looking like a decent human being, I need to look like a disrespectful American with too much money to burn. The doctor found it amusing, although a bit too close to the plot of a James Bond novel. After a while the doctor revealed he had made a considerable amount of money ghostwriting students' thesis. He charged for each page and had amassed an extensive system of bibliographical resources. Conrad, who had drunk a considerable number of beers in the hopes that he would sleep the rest of the way to Italy, said I used to read Jean Dupont's university emails, learned about their world, the topics of interest, the unframing, what they read, what their cultural surroundings are like, their anxieties, fears and ambitions. You could restart civilization with one of them if the bombs fall. Dr. Eskin recognized the book on Conrad's nightstand. The alchemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz and smiled relieved, he wasn't in an exotic holiday, but in a pilgrimage. Goff noticed he had passed some test. You know, Conrad started, tipsy by the beer, in his typical fashion of long-winded rants my dad owned a chemical plant, it's how he started in industrial real estate. Funny thing, chemistry, they can make any compound, control reality at a molecular level. It was a scientific revolution that rivals Galileo. They weren't attacked by the church or any other persecution. Instead, the economic consequence pushed the dominoes to start World War II. It's the amount of material available at hand that decided Germany's role in the 20th century. Hitler was the ideal overseer and war would increment the amount of material by exponential degrees. All other ideology, neurosis, or anxiety was secondary. They escalated their operations without regard for sides in the war, both the Allies and the Axis depended on them. The same way they started the war, they decided it should be America that should win. They simply moved with their families and relocated operations, the company names changed but its industrial gold mine remained the same. They fabricate the hormones and financed the fight for the transsexual rights and representation, because it's good for profit. The same way they started a war and decided its outcome, they now change the way we view humanity and biology. They will terraform the world into the outcome of our perennial ambitions. If you ever want to take a peek behind the curtain, read the company's documents, the day-to-day -day operations and the CEO's emails. The doctor thought about it and, before he could understand it all, Conrad yawned and looked at him exhaustedly. Goff excused himself, got comfortable and passed out. He dreamed of forbidden monasteries in the Turkish mountains, rough buildings on the cliffs of mountains of weeds and stones. Priceless icons on moldy halls and passageways. Whispers of prayers faintly echoing from vaulted ceilings. Promises made, oaths taken, suspicious looks. Gardens assaulted with rain and hail, meager vegetables. The sky was overcast in his dreams, there was a heavy oppression coming from the sky. The walls weren't closing in, the ceiling was. He woke up with the laughter of children, kids were running in the aisles and everyone was chatting lively. They were reaching the Venice Marco Polo airport felt a mixture of pride at having achieved a milestone in the history of uninterrupted high-altitude sleep and hangover. He didn't disturb the doctor, who seemed very interested in a 70s movie about diamond thieves in a South African diamond mine. He really hoped he wouldn't follow him to the docks, he would have to kill him. He liked the man, he didn't like the surprise, however. He felt safe in Italy, which wasn't good news for Dr. Eskin. He parted ways with the doctor and, after picking up his luggage, made for the exit. He knew some of the people that worked on a boat rental, they had a prosperous business shipping people in and out of the Adriatic coast and with the help of a stack of euros he managed to secure transport to Trieste, on the Slovenian coast. Smugglers in a private airfield could fly him to Turkey and pick him up the same way. Conrad had fistfuls of jewelry to pay the smugglers on each stop, watches, rings and earrings and if everything went right, he wouldn't be flagged by the Turkish or American governments. The smuggling route, 
which his father had used to mobilize potential clients in and out of Central Asia had made them a lot of money. Conrad had no doubt army intelligence in the region knew about it, from what he had heard it even helped corrupt Turkish officers evade capture on several occasions. Conrad's father, Felix Goff, had spent five years traveling along the Adriatic Sea for the import-slash-export business, moving tons of rock, wood and raw materials for a host of clients in northern Italy. In those days the family money was all tied together in the building of St. Bernadette, a 100-meter building, with 33 floors, 9 elevators and more than 20 luxury apartments. As much as he liked the import and export business, that tower had been his gamble. It alone provided for Conrad, his two sisters and his wife. The construction, however, had been plagued with constant headaches and had almost been halted and cancelled while he was on a freighter ship on the coast of Albania babysitting marble containers. Martha almost divorced him and he vowed he would never return to the Adriatic. The promise had been revoked fifteen years later, when Conrad invited him to a week of sailing from Venice to Athens. Martha blessed the trip but was too busy with XGHTV to travel with them, the station was beginning to take off thanks to her leadership. They sailed on a sail yacht, an Oceanus 51, a 52 feet long boat that could do 10 knots on a good day. Conrad had precious memories of the trip, that had been the last excursion with his father before he had fallen ill and ultimately in a coma. They didn't know much about sailing, but they were very good at pretending that they did. Conrad had told his father I want to run something by you which was his way of bonding. Felix, who had worked his whole life to become a Californian power broker knew little of violence, but a lot about conducting a lengthy war. During a relaxed week the two went over Conrad's papers and computer hard drives, analyzing the intricate plans and following Conrad's line of thinking. Felix had the almost supernatural ability to find weak points in anyone's plans. Martha often joked he would argue with St. Peter in the pearly gates. Where did the information come from? Asked Felix, holding the robust files with one hand while he printed even more pages with the other. Conrad smiled and said Mimex, the software company, it has more than six hackers working on this on a 24 7 basis. They hire more with cryptocurrencies. We started to piece together the puzzle after XGHTV got that satellite contract, we finally have our data haven. They walked up the stairs to the living room where the colorful glow charts had been assembled. Conrad lighted a cigarette and found himself beaming, he had finally impressed Felix Goff. Social Zone of Influence, a deep study on social ecosystems, with a pool of over 2,000 people. It forms a coherent interwoven network of 227 nodes. These nodes will be taken down, the entire network that makes the CIA possible will be gone. Wildly varying backgrounds, with some commonalities, they keep the American Empire strong and marching. The Mimex boys will take care of tracking them down, I take them out alongside three other teams comprised of organized crime experts. Felix Goff stretched his hand to bum a smoke and thought about it. It wasn't impossible, Conrad had made the connections to pull it of. He had trained and had experience in combat and in working alone under pressure. Felix smiled, he could do it, that crazy Conrad could actually do it. Felix imagined his ancestors, Hessian mercenaries, salivating at the possibility of killing Washington, Jefferson, and all the others. Impossible then but now that Conrad had inserted eyes and ears in every intelligence community and database, it was possible. He remembered when Conrad had been shot in Belarus and shuddered at the thought of being discovered. Conrad could read his expression and quickly changed the subject while he pretended to be admiring the sunset. Remember when you and Fred Bolt had that dispute? Our neighbor in 94. Felix smiled and nodded along. Conrad continued he was so angry that you won the cover of Designer Magazine. Said Mom had produced the front yard with network money. Felix accompanied his son to the rudder and starting checking the gauges and buttons. The three-hour class had covered everything but now he barely remembered what anything was. Slowly the realization of the gravity of his son's plans began to dawn on him. He felt a hole was opening under his feet, as if the world could simply eat him alive, or worse, 
Eat Conrad. The Neighbor Wars of 94 and 95, was it 95? Felix nodded absent-mindedly. He tossed toilet paper over our house and Nadine tossed eggs at his. Felix opened a beer and cleared his head. Conrad waited with bated breath as his father battled love and dread in equal measures. It could only go down one of two ways, either Felix would panic or not. After a minute or two he finally said, with a broken voice Fred was a good man, but he never forgave me for suggesting he buy those plastic parrots for his porch. It cost him the magazine cover, or so he said. I don't know much about that stuff, but I know what tacky is and those were tacky. Conrad looked him in the eyes and Felix looked at the sunset breathing heavily graffiti on the car, that was definite escalation. Felix patted him on the back and sat on the deck trying to sound cheerful it was a grand gesture what you did. Felix shrugged his shoulders, more calmly the least I could do after what happened to his dog, Lena told me about it in the airport. I was coming back from Yugoslavia, needed something cheerful to, to see things differently. I actually missed those gags and pranks while I was in Serbia. Gave him the coveted 1956 Mercury Coupe. Conrad said 1955 and he couldn't believe it. He used to mow the lawn just to have an excuse to be near it. Felix stepped out of the cockpit and, with his arms crossed and looking at the cerulean blue of the sea and the melting ball of gold that was the sun simply said where does time go when it goes. That first night Felix didn't sleep for a moment and Conrad had nightmares over worrying for his father. Theirs was a martial family, plenty of soldiers and gun merchants, there was always the moment when fathers would have to say their farewells to their children, it was unavoidable. This did little to comfort Felix, after all Conrad's enemy was more powerful than the Roman legions that once had threatened their native country. On a very basic level, on a primal dimension, Felix wholeheartedly understood his son's obsession. He dealt with some of those people, he made business and favors for them, and felt a deep revulsion for them. They were unclean and his son would carry out the vengeance of millions of people. He wouldn't be remembered, if everything went according to plan, but Felix knew, according to ancestral family tradition, that God forgave soldiers who battled the devil and its hordes. The beginning of the war is silent. Said Felix the next day once they set up a task force all these will go into hiding. He pointed at the grey nodes on the network's charts. After that. Will they go public? They would never tell the truth, but a version of the truth. Suspects, arrests, executions, Felix pointed at the company names marked on green will Boeing change the location of their R&D hangars? Will DARPA shut down just for the security issue? Conrad was about to jump into the sea, he sat on the ledge instead. Boeing needs to be hit before that happens, their new prototype has allowed them to buy twice the credit as same year, but by the December quarterly report they'll have the project finalized. I know the director, he never misses. He can die later, but I need to sabotage them before that report. My team has everything ready for it. I can't tell you much about them, but they're good people. Felix took off his shirt and jumped board with his son. They swam together and he said they'll never forgive you, but you must never blame yourself. Once the task force is created you'll feel boxed in, on rails, but that's only an illusion. Trust your people. He didn't say anything else about the war that day. They were together. They were happy. They would never share a moment like that again and deep down they both knew it. Conrad flew across Albania with drug smugglers. They had a system in place, a good system, they masqueraded as army intelligence with hacked codes and satellite confirmation. Goff was running short on jewelry, he barely had enough for the trip back, but the pilot assured him he would wait in the Turkish airfield. He could trust him, as his father had told him, but then again, he wasn't really his people. In case of emergency, if the plane wasn't there, he would rely on Dr. Eskin to get money for Turkish smugglers. The cargo plane was mostly empty, aside from boxes wrapped in plastic. They belonged to a company that had gone under while they were in the air, now they were nobody's property. The pilot had called them fancy air trash. He was a germaphobe, 
flying a 737 with two masks and medical goggles. Conrad noticed he was a drug addict, given the ticks with his hands and his sweat, he wasn't having a good time and Conrad preferred to leave him alone. He didn't know if he was careful or overreacting, Felix Goff after all, had fallen sick of COVID and, after two days on a ventilator, fell into a deep coma. Nadine and Lena had gotten into a yelling match with the doctors, refusing to unplug the machines that kept him alive. Martha couldn't even handle the topic and Conrad swore he would dedicate the family fund in keeping him alive as long as possible. His sisters were closer to his mom than he was, they were married away from the family business and, even though they hated it, they could count on him to shoulder the responsibility. In Conrad's experience criminals were always closer to their families than the political and industrial power brokers of California. It has been a point of pride for Felix who was always fond of saying Catholics take care of their families, we're not like those soulless Protestants. Martha didn't have a prejudice against Protestants, even though she also came from northern Germany, were Catholics and Lutherans had killed each other with abandon. The hatred had survived, but like she said every now and then hate can be a good motivator. Felix had even made several apologies to hatred during the height of the pandemic. They killed five million people so that rootless soulless ghouls can groom children on the internet and make some money. He had finally understood Conrad's deep-seated hatred for the American establishment. The ever-hungry Moloch that could never be satisfied. Zanzibar had become a war cry that bonded them together. A reason to fight, a reason to push. Now it was a matter of days before a task force had been assembled by the NSA and CIA. The names would come through the compromised computers of naval army intelligence. Conrad would finally know who was going to kill him. They landed 10 miles from Mulas on a small airport for logistics and cargo. Conrad had the co-pilot's papers and identity and without much travel they both managed to get a room with a hot shower. He was completely under the radar, only two people knew he was there and he couldn't fight the feeling that the world would end and he wouldn't know. Perhaps right as he was washing the hair he had left Sad Boy had been arrested, maybe Barbieri, maybe everyone. He would find out on Monday, for now he would eat a hearty meal and watch television like every other guest of that run-down hotel. To Dr. Haluk Eskin it was a pilgrimage, a spiritual journey. His sister, recently married, his soul happy and awaiting enlightenment. Conrad, on the other hand, couldn't stop thinking about his week-long sailing vacation with his father. The tame Adriatic waves, the collection of cheeses they had prepared, the Cuban cigars, whiskey and brandy, the smiles and laughter, it all seemed to have happened on TV. He didn't have the budget to produce Brutalismo, his flagship program outside of a studio, but with a few computer touches it could all be arranged. Would he see his face plastered on every screen one day? Would Brutalismo have a third season? Would his mother ever forgive herself for not accompanying them to their voyage? He didn't know and he would probably never know. To Dr. Eskin it was a pilgrimage of esoteric meaning, to him it was a prayer. He didn't expect enlightenment, he expected a chance to beg for heavenly mercy. Conrad spent the night on the cheap bed smoking cigarettes and listening to the neighbor's loud radio for company. The sun cracked the dark horizon drowning the world on virgin rays. A drab and depressing urban maze began to wake up. Conrad changed clothes and used a beat-up Toyota Civic that the pilot had arranged for him, driving slowly and carefully to avoid the ever-present eyes of the Turkish police. Mobster hitmen, spooks and professional assassins had all been detained or killed because of random chance, like a cop pulling over their car, mistakes and simple coincidences were enough to thwart the best plans. He hadn't encountered many problems on the first part of the war, police hadn't been alerted to potential terrorists. It was a matter of time, all he could do was operate carefully and tread lightly. A patrol car, observing a crash and eight angry people on a shouting match waves at him to pass and he smiled feeling his breakfast climbing through his stomach all the way to his throat. And just like that. Barbieri was fond of admonishing just like that. His breakfast went back down a mile away from the police. Conrad spotted Dr. Eskin in a Prius ahead of him. They drove in caravan with seven other cars, some with one person, 
others with enough people to be considered a clown car. They drove off-road for a couple of miles. White pebble stones on yellow dirt, dehydrated roots and hollowed-out trees. The place had been dead since the first cities of mankind were erected. There weren't any ruins around, the whole thing could have been a trap of some sort. The primitive road ended in a hill where the cars were parked in file. People stepped out, stretched and kept to themselves. Conrad made sure he was still carrying the knife under his belt. He didn't like being disconnected from the world, after all his phone and computer were by now a part of himself. Here, under a blue sky and raging winds, he trusted only himself and imitated Dr. Eskin, who must have thought something similar for he didn't talk to Goff at all, eyeing everyone else with suspicion. The hill went upwards into a steep incline of rock and dirt. From the air Turkey was mountainous ranges and little else. The cradle of civilization rested on jagged edges, rough terrain. Pebbles on top of rocks on top of even bigger rocks, all of them eroding since mankind was able to string a sentence. The open morning sky seemed somehow hostile, somehow cold and distant. The wind made whispers and howls as it batted dead trees. Men and women in a single file to a small plateau, some dressed in suits, others in priestly garb and others in second-hand clothing. Conrad spotted four ringleaders with faces as rough as the stones under his feet. They had white robes and carried machine guns, looking at the invited guests through dark sunglasses. Speaking in murmurs, and close to people's faces, they explained the rules to everyone as they marched. They were to pray in silence, follow the others and touch Alexander's head with the right palm, they were to come back in another single file, get into their cars and drive away. Who were these people? Conrad was intrigued, as he knew everyone else was. People like them, like the 737 cargo plane pilot or like him, were they a race apart? Conrad called them midnight people when talking to his girlfriend. Mysteries that walked the earth with strange purposes never to be seen on a screen unless they were dead or persecuted. Criminals, of one kind of another, dark influences tugging at the strings of history. They all had their reasons, some noble and some ignoble, all of them real in a way regular citizens would never understand. Living contradictions in a crash course with fate. The stone head of Alexander could have been any other king or general. It could have been medieval or ancient. It could have been placed there the day before, but it was obvious that it hadn't been. Six meters tall and eight wide the face has been eroded by time and fury. Pieces were missing along the sides of the face and a piece of the nose had a bullet hole in it. It rested semi-hidden by the rocks. It had witnessed mankind fumble and march through the centuries in complete silence. The pilgrims would walk up to him, caress its porous surface and turn back. The wind carried their prayers. Some in Latin, others in Farsi, others in Greek and others in Turkish. Dr. Eskin was murmuring the first surah of the Quran in Turkish, hands extended to receive God's grace with his eyes looking at the king of the world with a sense of ecstatic religious fervor. He had finally done it, a pilgrimage to the center of the earth. His smile widened and relaxed, his soul had found something it didn't know it needed. He gently caressed the massive nose. Suddenly his shirt and his trousers caught fire, small flames that ate through the fabric and burnt all the way to the fat. The pillar of fire walked two steps and flailed its arms for a moment before falling downhill, rolling all the way down until it was nothing but smoking flesh. Conrad walked forward and touched the stone, his eyes still hurt and his nose was filled with the stench of burnt human flesh. He whispered a word Zanzibar. That was his prayer. He didn't need any other. He smiled, his eyes watery with tears. He turned back and walked to his car in a state of elation he hadn't felt in many years. The organizers had witnessed the fate of Dr. Haylock Eskin. They shrugged their shoulders as if it were a normal occurrence and perhaps it was. Conrad didn't need to kill him now and he knew God had heard his prayer. The worldly concerns had been squashed by otherworldly promises. The world was beginning to open up to him, it wasn't eating him but blooming like a savage flower. A whole new continent presented to him and he felt what the first builders of cities felt, gravity's pull to wonders beyond comprehension. He drove back to the hotel, 
his head filled with dreams. The end.